Well, so settle in because we've got kind of a lengthy video. I might even have to cut it into part one and part two, maybe even part three. Who knows? But I am going to attack head on this false doctrine that says that we are not saved by what we do, by works. Now you're going to go, what? No way. You are a heretic. You are not right. That's not what the word of God says. The fact that you say the word of God for the Bible means that you're an idolater. Stop it. The Bible is not the word of God. <gasps> Ron, what are you saying? The Bible is not inspired by God. I didn't say that. I said the Bible is not the word of God. There is one word of God who was incarnate in the man Jesus Christ. So it says, in archen hologos, kai logos, kai hologos in proston theon, kai theos in hologos. I'm not reading that. I memorized it because it's one of the most important set of verses in the entire Bible. John goes back to Genesis and he tells the relationship of Jesus Christ to the creation in those words. In the beginning and authority, both at the same time, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. It became flesh and tented among us. He became flesh and tented among us. All things were created by Him, and nothing that exists exists apart from Him, at a distance from Him. All things, all things, nothing that exists exists at a distance apart from Him. So, the Bible itself, if you have reverence for the Bible, then you are going to throw out the doctrines of men. You're going to throw those out. And you're going to listen to Jesus Christ and his holy apostles. Holy means terrifyingly clean. How are they terrifyingly clean? Because Jesus breathed on them and gave them the authority. And then Pentecost happened as well. And the Holy Spirit came. And they exercised this authority, establishing the church and becoming the 12 foundations of the city of God. If you don't accept their teaching, then you will be damned to the lake of burning sulfur. End of story. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're John Piper, John MacArthur. I don't care who you are. Even if you're the Pope, well, in this case, even the, the Catholics are saying that this Pope is being led of the devil. They're ready to throw him out if he doesn't resign. So that's where it's gotten with that. I don't care who you are. If you do not agree with Scripture and do Scripture, you will not be saved. Period. Now I'm going to prove it to you that this is, a, this is the great deception that Paul talked about that would come upon the world, that would lead them into the apostate church, that would rise the apostate church up. It came as a separation from the historic church. That's what the Protestant Reformation was. I'm not saying there weren't good things that came out of that. There were good things that happened, but not necessarily because of the Protestant Reformation. Just other things that were happening at the time, like the printing press. The printing press is what gave us Bibles into our hands, not the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation leveraged that event in order to distinguish themselves from the historic church and establish themselves separately as a separate authority against the Catholic Church. <clears throat> now you think, well, that's good because the Catholic Church had so many abuses in it. It did. But tell me the Protestant church has not had abuses in it or doesn't have abuses in it today. Absolutely. Many, many, and some of them are even worse than the Catholic church. So we're not going to get into that in this video. Let's get into the issue of works and salvation. Now understand that when we read scriptures, the scriptures, we find that there's not just one time that we are saved. There's not just one time that we're saved. 
The word save in salvation means rescued or rescuing. How many times are we rescued? And how many things are we rescued from? Well, the first rescuing, the first salvation, is out of the world, out of the whole collection of individuals. We are rescued out of that. We are snatched out of that, brought out of that. That's what we usually point to as our conversion story. But that's not the end of the story. That's only the beginning. And it doesn't guarantee a certain end. It only guarantees a certain beginning. We are rescued out of the world. But then we still have sin. And the problem is that many Christians never are saved the second time. The second rescuing never happens for them. And the devil has made sure of it by teaching his false gospel and building this apostate church of half-baked Christians. The ones who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, so-called, but never really as Lord. So they never experience the power of the resurrection over sin. They do not stop sinning. And they justify it with this sick, evil doctrine that I have sin nature living in me and I will have sin nature living in me as long as I am alive in the body and that I cannot help but sin. That's not true. That is absolutely not true. So Jesus didn't have any power over sin. Oh yes, but it's, we're not going to see it until, until the next life. No. That's not the gospel story. That's not the gospel message. That's not what we hear from Christ's teachings. So the second salvation, the second rescuing, is from sin. First from the world, then from sin. And the last salvation is at the final judgment. The third, right, is at the final judgment. And that's where we are judged by our works in this life. If we've been rescued the second time, then we will definitely pass that judgment because we've been rescued from sin. Therefore, our works will pass the judgment. So, if we are rescued that third time from God's wrath, that's what we're rescued from in the third and final one, we are also rescued into eternal life. Now, these first two, you could say, are rescuing into eternal life, but there are still conditions along the way. The rescuing out of the world is not on a condition. We're given that. There are, there's one condition and that is humility. Because it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And if we're saved by grace, we cannot have grace given us unless we are first humble. Now, whether we humble ourselves or we are humbled by God, we must be humbled or, or humble ourselves first before we receive grace. That's a principle and it's stated by both Peter and James and they're quoting the Old Testament. This is a foundational principle of the Christian life and if you find that you're not having grace in your life, the first thing to do is humble yourself before the Lord. It doesn't matter about other men. Humble yourself before the Lord. That's how you receive grace. But that doesn't guarantee grace. That just puts you in a position where you can receive grace. Because if you do not humble yourself, even if God wants to give you grace, he will not. Because he set this principle that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And there are only two choices. You're either proud or humble. And if you're not humble, you're proud. No matter whether you think you're proud or not. So if you want God's grace, you must humble yourself. If you don't have God's grace in your life, humble yourself. Continue to humble yourself and wait on the Lord until he lifts you up. So now let's look at a, an article here by John Piper. And I'm going to show how he goes awry with his teaching. So here you can see the article here. Uh, you can see the address if you want to go find it on the Internet and read it. And this is by John Piper right here, founder and teacher of DesiringGod.org. Okay. So, whether he desires God or not, that's debatable, right? But um, definitely his teaching is, is wrong, absolutely wrong. It's a false gospel. And this is the foundational gospel of the apostate church. 
So this first paragraph really does say it well from their perspective. One of the questions raised about death is whether Christians face a divine judgment, and if so, why and what kind? It is a good question because on the one hand, we believe, this is the, the apostate church, we believe that our acceptance with God is based on free grace purchased by the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, and that this acceptance is attained through faith, not earned through meritorious works. Notice meritorious works. Right, that's added in there in order to qualify works, but he never talks about other works. But on the other hand, the New Testament frequently, frequently teaches that believers will be judged by God along with all men, and that both our eternal life and our varied rewards, nowhere in Scripture does it talk about varied rewards, will be according to works. This is an invention of the apostate church, that there's some other kind of reward besides eternal life. There are responsibilities that are given. They're not rewards. For example, in the parable of the talents, where it says that those who have been faithful with the, the one who's been faithful with much will be put over many cities, and the one who's been faithful with with some will be put over some cities, right? And so those aren't rewards. Those are responsibilities where they're actually going to continue to wor do work for the Lord. So it has nothing to do with rewards. You know, at first I thought maybe that has to do with rewards, but it was very easy. You know, as soon as that thought came, I realized, no, that's not possible because this is about responsibility, not about rewards. There's no reward in being given governance over 10 cities. What reward? That's a responsibility. The Lord is counting on you to take care of this for him. It's a responsibility. So there are no varied rewards mentioned in the Bible at all. In fact, the, the only reward mentioned, including for our works, is eternal life. And the only reason they can't accept it is because they set up this doctrine at the beginning of their separation from the historic church in order to say that works, salvation by works is evil. That's it. That's their foundational tenet. And they have just a few of these, that if anything contradicts this foundational tenet, it is wrong. And if scripture seems to, then we don't understand that scripture. So they make these foundational tenets, which are not biblical, and then they measure the Bible based on it, and they say, well, I must not understand that scripture because it doesn't match this foundational tenet, which is from our movement and not from scripture. Now, they'll, they'll try to justify these from Scripture. Don't get me wrong, but it's from a misreading of Scripture. So, for example, that we are saved by faith alone. There's absolutely nowhere that it says it. And in fact, it says exactly the opposite. Faith without works is dead. Right? So it's impossible for a man to be saved by faith alone. James makes that crystal clear. It's the only place where the relationship between faith and works is exactly said. There's nowhere else in Scripture, anywhere, and especially nowhere in Paul's writings, where he explains the relationship between faith and works directly. So James is the only one. Jacob is his actual name. And you'll find on our uh, channel here in our website that it's the book of Jacob. Okay, so... If you're looking for the book of James and you can't find it, look for Jacob, because that's his real name. Okay, so let's keep going with this. So I'm going to point out these things in this. It says, um, let's see, we believe that our acceptance with God is based on free grace. The word free is never used with grace, and it's never used with the word gift. And oftentimes, the word grace is translated gift wrongly of course because the word grace does not mean gift it's cheerfulness li literally cheerfulness but there is an actual word for gift and you'll find them translating this word grace as gift but when the translation includes the word free that is a deception it's never put there in the text then it says purchased by the substitutionary sacrifice of christ so our acceptance, he says, is, a, is based on free grace, and our acceptance is purchased by, so someone bought our acceptance 
from God. So someone bought God off. That's what they're saying. That's what Piper is literally saying here, is that God was bought off by the death of Christ. Really? So you can claim that God is corrupt? That he can be bought off? His justice can be corrupted? God's justice cannot be corrupted. And saying that God can be bought off is saying that God can be corrupted and his justice can be perverted. Purchased by the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. This word substitutionary does not exist in Scripture. It doesn't. Now there's a controversial word imputed, where they talk about the righteousness of Christ is imputed. And there is a place in Scripture where that word is a translation of a Greek word, which in other places, most other places, is translated differently. It's not imputed. It's not imputed at all. It's accounted. It's like to lay forth. Um, it's like from the word logo, logizomai. So it's from laying forth. So it's an accounting, which means that there's a reckoning, right? So if I give you credit, you're going to have to pay that back. And in this case, it was credit for you so that you could enter in and not earn your way in. But you still have to pay that back. You still have to begin working. So you're saved out of the whole, the whole group of individuals, but not for nothing. Christ has a reason for you being saved out of the whole collection of individuals because in the whole collection of individuals, you're all following the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you're enemies of God. Christ saved you out of the world for a reason. And if you don't stop being enemies of God, then you are not paying off your debt. You're not balancing the account. And what happens when you get to the end, when you are judged, God looks at this and he says, Here are your works. Not only that, for you in particular, these works that were lacking are even more serious because I gave you credit. I brought you out of the whole collection of individuals without you having to do anything. Save, be humble. That's it. I gave you credit. I gave you an account. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. But I gave it to you. And I brought you out of the whole collection of individuals. And what did you do in return as gratitude towards this great salvation that brought you out of the world that you couldn't leave yourself. You couldn't escape the lust of the flesh. You couldn't escape the lust of the eyes, the eyes of man which are never full. You couldn't stop being prideful about your life. You had no power or ability to do that, and I brought you out of the world so that you would have that possibility. You had a possibility of the second salvation, which you ignored, mistreated, treated with contempt, claimed that you couldn't escape sin and that sin was your master, in order to not step up through that salvation, through the stopping of your sin. And now we're at the judgment seat, and this is where the third salvation is supposed to happen. But yours cannot because you don't have that second salvation. You were not saved by sin, from sin. You are now facing God's wrath. And you will not be saved by God's wrath because you were not saved from sin. That's how it works. Substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. It's not substitutionary in the, in the sense that he is doing it for us. He doesn't fulfill the law for us. He doesn't fulfill the requirements, the righteous requirements of the law for us. He doesn't walk according to the Spirit for us. That's what we are called to do. We are called to do that. Christ died and brought us into this great salvation. The overall three salvations together is a great salvation. 
that has its beginning, its middle, and its end. His death opened the way for us. His death opened the way for us. Without it, it would not be possible according to God's plan. If God had planned it differently, it would have been possible differently, but it's not. And that's how we enter in. So it's not a substitutionary sacrifice of Christ in the sense that we are taught by the Protestant churches. And that this acceptance is attained through faith, not earned through meritorious works. No. The acceptance of God is not by our faith. It says faith without works is dead. That also means dead to God. It says he even argued even the demons believe and shiver. So if the demons believe and have faith, because believe and faith are the same thing, same word. If the demons have faith and acceptance by God is based on faith alone, then the demons are accepted by God. You wicked men, you absolutely perverse and wicked men. How dare you pervert the word of God from Jesus Christ and the testimony of God that's written in the Bible in order to support your wicked, wicked, wicked ways. Demons are not accepted by God. And if you think that you can be accepted by God by faith alone, then you are justifying demons. Now tell me it's not a demonic doctrine. It is not God's doctrine. You're not saved by faith alone. Our acceptance by God is not attained through faith alone. It's faith and works, faith and works, faith and works. And those come by grace from God, by cheerfulness of God. He cheerfully gives us faith and works. And if we do not exercise that faith and we do not do those works, those particular works that he gives you, we're not accepted by God. We will not pass the judgment. We will not be given the reward of eternal life, which is the only reward. Meritorious works. He's trying to qualify works, and it seems like he's saying that there's more kinds of works besides meritorious works. He's not. He doesn't even need to say meritorious works. He should just say not earned through any works, because that's what he really means. But on the other hand, the New Testament frequently teaches that believers will be judged by God along with all men and that both our eternal life and our varied rewards will be according to works. A varied rewards. There are no varied rewards in the scriptures. There are none. It's eternal life. That's what it's about. That's all it's about. And that is everything. For example, Romans 2, 6 through 8 says, God will render to every man according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are factious and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. Notice, there is only one reward. The reward is not glory, honor, and immortality. That's what we seek by well-doing. But what does he give us? He gives us the goal, the only reward, which is eternal life. But for those who are factious, trying to create factions like divisions and trying to argue and create contention over things that have nothing to do with the truth, and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. It says this passage teaches that eternal life will be according to works. But this does not mean that it will be earned by works, really. <laughs> really. Okay, let's see what he says. In, in Romans, now he tries to justify this false distinction. In Romans 6.23, Paul says, The free gift of God 
is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so I want you to see first, here's the King James. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Even they get it wrong. The word absolutely cannot mean gift. Okay, it's cheerful disposition at best. So let's go ahead and have a look at this. Notice the word free is not there either, which is injected by some translations in order to support strongly this apostate belief that, that this is a free gift of God. It is not a free and is not a gift of God. This is the gracious disposition of God. And um, let's go ahead and have a look at the Greek here. So I'm going to switch over here to the Greek. Don't be scared, right? Here's a bunch of Greek here, right? But I'll point you out to the word here, which is right here is charisma. Yes, like charisma. This is the word but, which always gets shifted over one word, right? Because this is an article that goes with charisma. This is uh, nominative singular neutral. You can, you can see it over here. It'll show here in the left column when I hover over it. It says nominative singular neuter. This is identical. Nominative singular neuter. There it is. Nom nominative singular neuter. Okay. This is the noun and this is a definite article. The charisma. But, but the charisma of the God and is oftentimes is left out of the text, so we have to read it in there when there's no verb. That's true of other languages like Russian and Ukrainian. So, um, but the charisma of the God is the life everlasting in Christ Jesus. Okay, all right. So charisma, that's the word that we're focusing on because the first part is for, that would also get shifted over. A lot of these conjunctions are set in the second position of the clause. So we go for the, this is a definite article feminine for, for what's coming ahead. For the, as plural, notice, and this is plural as well. I'm sorry, I said feminine, it's uh, neuter. For the and this is an interesting word. It's the rations for a soldier, right? Um, it comes from, let's have a look here. It comes from food, right? So this word is ration for soldier, like kind of like a, a kind of a pay, I guess, but I wouldn't call it a pay. It's food that they live off of while they're at war. So for the, the food of a soldier of sin, this is the word for sin, it means without allotment, is death, is is missing again. For the, the food, the food of the soldier of the sin, of the being without allotment, is death. But the charisma of the God is life everlasting in Christ Jesus of uh, our Lord. It's not of, it's dative. Of, uh, uh, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's all dative. That means this is all connected together. So here's the thing, is that this word charisma, we can look here. If we drill down, because here they even have some things that are incorrect as well. It says IE. Anything after IE is all speculation. It's all metaphors, figurative language, extensions, things like that. It's not the actual uh, word. And here you have IE also. So really the only thing here that, that they don't put under the parts that we ignore is a divine gratuity. And divine's in parentheses too. A gratuity. All right? So... It's like, it sounds like a free gift, right? But that's not what it actually means. Let's drill down. Charisma comes from karizomai. You can see here in the English, karizomai. It's to grant as a favor, they say, which is also incorrect. Let's keep going. Drill down. It comes from karis. All right, now we get to a, a pretty basic word. It means graciousness. 
It says, as gratifying. Ignore that part. It's graciousness. Of manner or act. Okay. Let's go drill down one more. Cairo, which means to be cheerful. Right? This really means cheerful. It's to be cheerful. So when we drill back down just before we get to cheerful, graciousness is cheerfulness. Because this comes from the verb to be cheerful. This is cheerfulness. Let's drill down just below this. This is a giving of cheerfulness. Karizomai, giving of cheerfulness. It's no longer to be cheerful. It's to, a giving of cheerfulness. A giving of cheerfulness. So what is this then? This is the gift of cheerfulness. Or we can say a cheerful gift. It's more accurate. It's a cheerful gift. Doesn't mean it's free. It no, has, has nothing to say about a gift or, or um, free. Okay? So, giving cheerful. Right? You can say then, well, if you're giving something cheerfully, that means it's a gift. No. Just because you give something doesn't mean it's a gift. So there's a different word for gift, and I want to show you that. Okay, so here we've got it. Doran. Doran. Doran is a gift. That's what it is. It can be a gift, a present, or a sacrifice, according to this entry. Let's go ahead and scroll down. Now, this is, this is neuter, notice, okay, because there's also a femi feminine form, also, dorea, which is feminine. It also means a gift. They put in free gift or a gift without repayment, right? But that is read into it, okay? It's a gift. Right here, uh, Strong's exhaust, Exhaustive Concordance says gift. Down here, it says from doron, a gratuity or a gift. So let's have a look at that doron. That's what we were just looking at, which here is a gift, okay? And it says gift or offering. It says a present, especially a sacrifice. We don't need all that, right? It is a gift or not offering like, um, it's like a sacrifice, okay? But remember, sacrifice is given in exchange for something. It is. Even an offering is given in response to something. So it is not disconnected. It's not just out of the blue with nothing that happened to elicit it. Or nothing to happen afterwards. You're looking for the favor, the cheerfulness, that's a better word, cheerfulness of God. This is so that you can have the cheerfulness of God. If God is doing it, then it's out of his cheerfulness. So let's go ahead back to our text here. Let me switch this back over. Okay. So then this is, makes more sense then. It's not a gift. Doron is gift. This is not Doron. This is from Charis. Charisma. That's where we get the word charismatic from. Charis. If you want to drill down to the next level, it's Cairo, which is the verb, to be cheerful. It's about cheerfulness. It's not about what we think of as grace in English. It's about cheerfulness. It's about God's cheerfulness. Okay? That's what it's about. And it's for eternal life. That is the purpose. That is the purpose. And the way to eternal life is by our works being cleaned up. We stop sinning and we start doing what we're supposed to do. And if those don't happen, we do not receive eternal life. That means that eternal life is based on works, but also originally and initially based on the cheerfulness of God. So, let's go back to uh, John Piper. So, by him pointing to this verse, he's already undermined his own argument. This passage teaches that eternal life will be according to works, but, so he admits this passage teaches that eternal life is according to works. 
And he's right. It is according to works. Eternal life will be according to works. Even John Piper admits that that is what Paul said. He says, but this will not be earned by works. If it's according to works, it is earned by works. It is according to works. It is according to works. Boom. Eternal life. Now tell me that means it's not earned by works. If it's according to works, then it is earned by your works. Period. That's what according to means. <laughs> the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ our Lord. He quotes this incorrect translation of it using gift, which charis doesn't mean at all. There's a completely different word, completely unrelated to that, that means gift. Free is not in there anywhere. It is not at all in the text. It is not free and it is not a gift. But the cheerful, the cheerful giving of God is eternal life in Christ, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Aha! So this verse doesn't support his argument at all. And it doesn't go against the other teachings of God, like in Romans 2, 6 through 8. It doesn't contradict that, that the cheerful giving of God is eternal life. God wants to give you eternal life. And to give you eternal life brings him the greatest cheer. He cheerfully wants to give you eternal life. But he can't because your works do not deserve it. John Piper himself said it. This passage teaches that eternal life will be according to works. God wants to give it to you. But he can't because your works do not deserve it. If he gave you according to your works, you would be damned to the burning lake of sulfur. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Let me ask it again. Is that what you want? Do you want to be eternally in the place reserved for the devil? Reserved for the Antichrist. Reserved for the beast and the false prophet. Reserved for those without an allotment. Those sinners. You want to be there? Irrevocably? Because once you're there, you cannot change it. There's absolutely no way to reverse it or change it. You cannot at that point start doing good works and get out of the burning lake of sulfur. There is no escape. There is no escape ever, 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 ever. What do you want? Do you want eternal life with God and peace and joy forever? Or do you want to be in the burning lake of sulfur with the devil, with the dragon, with Satan, with the Antichrist, with the beast, with the false prophet, with the sinners who are wicked and perverse and sick, who will be punished, and you will be punished as well. And you cannot undo it. There's absolutely no way to undo it. God will never, ever, 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 ever undo it. It is irrevocable judgment. It will never be reversed. Is that what you want? Then go the way of Piper. Go the way of these false teachers. Go the way of these apostate men who trick and deceive people. Or you can follow the gospel of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, which Jesus Christ delivered unto us, entrusted to his holy apostles, who also preached and taught it, and you follow what they said, that by doing good, you will receive eternal life. That's what it says. Even Piper admitted that that's what it says. God will render to every man according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. He will give eternal life only to those 
who by patience, in well-doing, doing good, that's what it means, doing good, patience in doing good, doing good, doing good, doing good, are seeking glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are factious and do not obey the truth, not the truth of Piper, the truth of Jesus, but obey wickedness instead, they obey wickedness. I have sin nature in me and therefore I can't help but sin. Sin is your master then. You are obeying wickedness. Guess what your end will be? There will be wrath and fury. Today's your day to choose. Are you going to stop sinning and do good and seek glory and honor and immortality? Or are you going to continue to make excuses and sin and sin and sin and excuse yourself and sin and set up an idol of God who even excuses you? Like God has to forgive you. He doesn't have to forgive you. And I guarantee if you think that you can continue to sin and be forgiven, you think that you can fool God. You're not forgiven. If you think that, you're not forgiven. You are in your sins still. They've not been cleansed from you. You must walk in the light first. May the Lord bless you as you seek him and only as you seek him with all your heart. Remember to subscribe down below and like the video and share it on your Facebook and other social media. And then make a comment, whether a question or a comment. We read all of them and we try to respond to all. Get on over to our website, The Rooted Word, and start reading the translation and also the articles that we've posted. It's at therootedword.com, therootedword.com. And may the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart.